Um, today, Dee will be going through a number of presentations, looking at prayer and intercessory prayer and discipleship. And um, we're looking forward to what you'll be covering, Dee. Just some information on Dee. I want to let you know that Dee Casper is the director of the Core Evangelism Training Program. So if any of you are considering going to America to take part in the Core Evangelistic Training Program, you can check that out at www coreevangelism.com um, so do check that that out see if you'd um, be interested in doing some of that program you saw what the classroom looked like yesterday in the video um, just some more information on D D lived 30 minutes from 3ABN world headquarters for 21 years and had never heard of the seventh day adventist church but by the grace of God, he found the message through 3ABN TV beginning in the fall, or we would call the autumn of 2006. He was baptized in 2010 at the Arise Cornerstone program. Um, Arise stands for a resource institute for soul winning and evangelism and has been involved in ministry ever since. He has served as a Bible worker, being a Bible teacher in a, an academy academy setting and has taught in different schools of evangelism as well and d we're grateful to have you teaching at peace this time as well um, he loves investing in young people and opening their eyes to the beauty of the everlasting gospel and the value that god places on each and every one of them individually d thank you i'm going to open with a word of prayer and then i'm going to hand straight over to you so let's just open with a word of prayer Dear Lord, thank you so much for the privilege to have Dee with us here today. Lord, this is our last program at the Peace Center of Evangelism. I'm praying, Father, that as we go through um, these sessions, it's been a blessing so far. And I know that as Dee's presenting the last topic, talking on discipleship, I think it's fitting to close with that topic to encourage those who attend this session to be disciples for you, Lord. Spend time with you in prayer, in devotion, in praying for others, in walking with you, in having a, an experiential moment with you day by day. Father, as D presents, put the words in his mouth, and may each and every person be inspired, encouraged, and convicted by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Over to you, D. All right. Hey, thanks, Greg. I forgot how much I missed him until I saw his face on a computer screen. I pray for you all the time, man, but I forgot how much I missed you until I got to see you. Thank you, man. Um, I miss you too. I miss you too. <laughs> yeah, we need to, I need to get across the pond somehow. It's a long swim though. Um, well, thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here this evening for you, this afternoon for me. And thank you for being gracious and patient uh, in my day of travel. Yesterday I was flying the whole day and uh, misjudged my time on that. So I thank you, Craig, for being flexible. And I hope the video still proved to be a blessing. It's the same content I would have covered here, uh, same content, but, um, he was right. Uh, if you would like to come join us in the States, uh, the second semester of the core program at this stage is open to international students because it's within the, the timeline of a visitor's visa. Uh, we start in January and end at the end of May. You get a majority of our theology classes. You get five months of Bible work experience, uh, you get experience in doing practical work as well on the farm and in the cafeteria, and uh, you also get to be involved in evangelistic series. So if that is something of interest to you, coreevangelism.com, you can come check it out. Uh, you can hit up Peace and get some more field training by coming to Core in the spring. So it's a really cool opportunity to get even more field experience and learn from Mark Finley and David Ashrick and Justin Kim and Public Campus Ministries from the Michigan Conference and Chad and Fadia Cruiser and uh, many more, many more. So uh, Don McIntosh and James Rafferty and Stephen Grabner and, and others. So if you are interested in that, uh, go to our website, coreevangelism.com. We'd be happy to hear from you and see what we can do. Uh, all right. I'd like to pray. Craig's prayer is no more or no less meritorious than my own, but I just can't preach without praying. So let's, let's pray and then we'll start. God, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for what you're doing in England through peace. And we pray for your hand of blessing over it uh, and over their operations. And uh, running a school in the midst of a pandemic is difficult. We've all had to be flexible. And I thank you for inspiring this means of getting people trained. So bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right. So when I usually do a presentation on devotions, I also talk about prayer, intercessory prayer and personal prayer. Um, but in that particular video you saw yesterday, I wasn't there yet. I usually do like a longer presentation with my students on this. I can't give you that full length presentation, but I'll give you some highlights, some quick principles. And I want to jump into the topic of discipleship uh, with the remaining real estate that I have today. And so let me do this. And this. And Craig, if I did something awry, feel free to just hop in and let me know so I don't continue in foolishness. <laughs> All right. So finding power in personal prayer. My first piece of advice is to slow down. Uh, many of us, we are sprinting into the presence of Jesus saying a quick prayer and the running out the door without even recognizing that we were literally in the presence of our creator and to just slow down, enjoy that for a while and appreciate in whose presence you have come and to receive that blessing. So that's my first piece of advice is to slow down. Second of all, to praise him. Paul Vogoya talks about this, that it's not safe to pray until we've praised him enough to trust. So to slow down and to focus on how good and how faithful he's been to us, which in turn will lead us to pray prayers of faith because we actually believe that who we're praying to hears, cares, and will answer in our best interest. Uh, there it is. There's that quote. Okay. Pray for your own personal cleansing and reconciliation with God. Now, God is not running away from you. God is not opposed to you. Uh, but many times we have been apart from him. And so uh, seeking to remove all barriers to ensure that we can be on the proper footing and to embrace and, and grow that personal relationship. Be specific in what you're praying for. Uh, when you ask that God would be with you today, well, the thing is, he's omnipresent, like he's literally already there. So what is it that you want him to do for you? And the reason why I say this is when we just focus on broad prayers, we don't even know when our prayers are answered. And in turn, we aren't encouraged and we aren't inspired to pray more because we prayed such broad prayers. But if we prayed very focused and specific prayers, then it's more clear to see whether God is, is moving in certain areas and those prayers are being answered. Uh, I would encourage you to take some time at, as you're going through this process to pray out loud. Uh, it doesn't have to be loud enough for your roommate or your spouse or your kids to hear, um, but just under your breath to enunciate your prayers, because it's really easy, at least it is for me, for my mind to wander. Uh, and this has helped me to kind of be focused because I'm engaging more than one of my senses. I'm speaking and I'm listening to myself speak, which helps my mind to kind of stay focused on a particular track as I'm praying. If that's something you happen to struggle with, that's proved to be helpful for me, just under my breath. Um, and then claiming God's promises to hold him to the promises that he made. Daniel was big on this in Daniel 8 or in Daniel 9. Um, Moses was big on this and many other faithful saints of old. Be sure to claim the promises that God has made. This has been a huge, huge blessing. It's brought a massive revival in my experience a few years ago doing this. Because I remember thinking to myself, I read Melody Mason. That's another really great resource. I think it's going to be at the end of this brief presentation. Uh, Melody Mason wrote a book, a friend of mine, called Daring to Ask for More. And she talks about that whole process. And I remember reading her book. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Uh, but I wasn't really doing that. And once I did begin to do that, my whole prayer life radically changed. I'm so thankful for that. If you're wrestling from feelings of separation from God or darkness, ask yourself the earnest question, is there something that God has convicted me of that I've not surrendered to? Are there sins that I'm not wanting to deal with? Are there things that I place in higher estimation and importance than God in communion with him? Uh, sometimes the kind of fuzzy reception that we feel with heaven comes from things like this. And so to do an honest inventory and introspection um, can really kind of help uh, provide a form of a tune-up for us in that. Praying the scriptures back to God, uh, praying his promises to him word for word as he's written them. Taking time to listen. Many of us, our prayer life is a monologue. It's not a dialogue. We don't actually believe that God wants to talk back. And so in turn, we're asking why God won't speak to us, but we don't give him time to open his mouth. We pray, we say everything we want us to pray, and then we leave his presence. So to, to pump the brakes, to slow down, and to give time for God to speak to you in prayer. Um, and that we're praying to receive Jesus. Uh, Paul Vogoya kind of talks about this, that um, focusing on receiving him and not all kinds of stuff, um, because with him comes all the blessings that we need. And that's kind of the point that Pavel was making, that 
Um, God doesn't mail the blessings to us. The blessings come with him. So whatever you're needing, peace, joy, provision, whatever, um, comfort, instead of praying for specific things, and we can, but instead of just incessantly all the, all the time, time after time, after time, after time, after time, praying for the stuff that comes from him, we'll focus on receiving him and noting that everything that we need comes through him. Uh, this is in Psalm chapter 73, verses 25 to 28. This is a really good text. Psalm chapter 73, and beginning of verse 25. And I'll give my slides from yesterday and today to Craig. So you guys can have those too if you like them, if I'm moving too fast. Psalm 73, 25 to 28. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. Could we say that honestly? My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And uh, skip down to verse 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all his works. So my flesh and my heart fail, but God is that strength of my heart, uh, the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Try walking. Uh, I did this. Uh, if you can't see, I've got a quadruped here is sleeping next to my backpack. Uh, one of the things I learned to kind of hack life, I only have so much time to do certain things in the mornings, is to, I, I'll take him for a walk and I can listen to my prayer list. So uh, in my phone, I've got a uh, locked note in my phone and I have Siri read my prayer list to me. So my personal prayer list, then I have an intercessory prayer list. So I just highlight all of it and I hit the speak button, get the AirPods in, go for a walk. And I pray alongside Siri through my prayer list. And I, as I go for a walk, it's easier for me to kind of take in fresh air, oxygenate my brain. I get exercise. Prayer walks are such a blessing. I walked well over a thousand miles when I lived, lived in an academy, just walking and praying and just communing with God. And that, that season of my life was one of the richest of my life. And I'm so thankful for that. So give that a shot. And then try to foster a mindset of prayer throughout the day, uh, not just, you know, I pray in the morning and pray before I go to bed, or I pray when I eat, more as a form of superstition than genuine gratitude, I'm just saying. Uh, it would be nice to actually stop and realize how grateful we are for what God is doing, and not just, you know, saying it uh, without meaning it, just mechanically. But Foster a mindset of prayer throughout the day, bringing God into your thoughts, into your processes throughout the day. So instead of running to your phone all the time, uh, when, when you have a down moment, take time to just commune with God, to talk through the decisions you've made, the interactions you've had. Really, really, really helps. But prayer isn't just for our benefit, right? Uh, we're told this in the Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. That book is fire, by the way, if you haven't read it. Ellen White says this, in our petitions, we are to include our neighbors as well as ourselves. No one prays a right who seeks a blessing for himself alone. So uh, strong counsel from Auntie Ellen here to don't forget about our neighbor in our prayers. So intercessory prayer. Again, the same principle, slow down. Some of us, in Jesus' name, amen. We kind of just, you know, mash on the accelerator and run out of the presence of Jesus. His name is Jesus. It's the name above all names. He's the love of your life. Enjoy and appreciate being in his presence. And it makes a big change in your prayer life to just appreciate what you're actually engaging in and slow down. Again, to be specific about what you're praying for. Uh, the principle we talked about earlier, don't just say God be with so-and-so. He's already with them. What do you want him to do for them? So-and-so is battling cancer. Comfort them. If it could be in your will, heal them. Lessen the pain and the suffering they're going through. Give specific answers to prayer, right? The military doesn't send, they don't send missiles to zip codes, right? I don't know what you guys use overseas, but we call them zip codes here, right? They don't send them to like a community. They send it to a specific house, sometimes to a specific room and a specific address. Be intentional. Prayer is an act of war. Uh, send those guided missiles in the right direction. Again, that kind of praying under your breath, praying out loud can be helpful uh, just to be able to stay focused and not let your mind wander. It's not mandatory, but certainly has been helpful for me. Um, pray the blood of Jesus over these people and ask for the forgiveness of their sins. Uh, uh, Roger Morneau has a great book called Incredible Answers to Prayer, where he talks about this principle. I would strongly recommend reading that book on the topic of uh, intercessory prayer and, and principles on that. Give God permission to have his will carried out in these people's lives. 
You may be the only person in the universe who's praying that for these individuals because God can't go where God's not invited. And through intercessory prayer, we're giving God permission to do things that he could not do if we did not pray. And so give him permission to have his will carried out in their lives and that he would have the throne of their heart because, again, they may not be praying that. Claim the scripture promises over their situation. There's a beautiful promise. If you've got wayward children or family members or so forth, it's found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 16 and 17. Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Uh, and there are many more promises of that sort that could be claimed for these individuals, and God can do it. Uh, don't be afraid to pray bigger things for those that you care about. I don't have time to go into this because I really need to focus on discipleship. But I would encourage you, if you go to Audioverse, there's a message entitled, Why Prayer Matters. Uh, and I go into a lot more on this side of things, why prayer matters. There's another message on Audioverse called Keys to Unanswered Prayer. Uh, Keys to Unanswered Prayer, I think is what it's called, something like that. If you look at those two messages in Audioverse, that'll be able to kind of help you uh, with some more principles, at least have been helpful for me. Uh, there are many more resources that I'll give you at the end here, but uh, check into that. But we, many of us are praying too small. Uh, and God would encourage us to pray much bigger and bolder prayers for people. And man, there's some powerful answers we get when we do that. Their salvation is always the will of God. So make that a priority over everything else. You know for sure that that is his will. Be praying for that and be willing to yield to God's will. We may want things for people that God is not intending to give them because that wouldn't be their best interest. They're not in a stage of life to appreciate such things. We can't speak to all that, but be willing to yield to God's will and whatever it is we're asking for these individuals. And then ask God, have you even taken time to ask God what he wants you to pray for these people? Has that thought even entered your mind? Many times we're rolling into God's presence and bossing him around and telling him what to do. And we're not even asking, wait a minute. So what's on your heart, your heart about so-and-so today? What can I pray for? Pavel Goya has another statement here. As you can tell, I really appreciate his prayer stuff. Um, he has a statement, pray for what to pray before you pray for what you pray. Now he says it really fast with a Romanian accent, but pray for what to pray before you pray for what you pray. Is it good grammar? Probably not. I didn't go to college. It doesn't bother me. Anyway, really, really helpful principle to ask him that. And again, take time to listen. Uh, God, is there anything on your heart about this individual, something that I can be doing for them or that I can be praying for them and giving God a chance to speak into that space? Um, so anyway, that's generally something I lumped together with the devotions uh, resource. I just wanted to give those to you briefly. Uh, here's some really helpful resources that I have found in the topic of prayer. Um, incredible Answers to Prayer, again, by Roger Morneau. There's also like more Incredible Answers to Prayer, and I've got them. And I think there's Incredible, The Incredible Power of Prayer is like a sharing book. All of them are just full of amazing testimonies, uh, and I would encourage you to read those. My friend Melody's book, Daring to Ask for More. Um, Pavel Goya has his testimony in a book and Answers to Prayer and stuff called One Miracle After Another. Uh, you probably can't copy this link right now, but if you just search Pavel Goya, P-A-V-E-L, Goya, G-O-I-A, and then Vital Prayers. Next to that, if you Google that, it will take you to this website, NAD Prayer Ministries. And he has a whole series of sermons he's doing. I think this is how he's doing his, his dissertation, is through a series of sermons on this topic, and that's how he's doing it. But anyway, it's really, really good content. He did a seminar at ASI in 2016. That's an audio verse. It was great. And then uh, Pastor Mark Finley, he's got a seminar in audio verse called Busyness, Spirituality, and Vision uh, that was very, very helpful. Many of us, busyness is a, a great, great struggle of our lives. And I really appreciated some of the principles he gives on the topic of devotions and prayer time and so forth. So if you have any questions about the topic of prayer or personal devotions, we're going to address those uh, at the conclusion of this next presentation, I'll try to end to give time for questions. So that's uh, that's what I have to share on that side. Uh, for just a brief moment here, I'm going to um, share this. Um, all right, I got really scared. I didn't see Zoom anymore, but it's there. Okay. 
So share this one, this one, and this one. All right, the greatest commission, talking about the topic of discipleship. Um, so this is the goal of a disciple. Jesus says in John chapter 17 and verse three, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So our goal as disciples of Jesus and for the people that we're discipling is eternal life. That's what that's like. That's the standard. That's what we're shooting for. And that eternal life is found in a genuine, heartfelt surrender to Jesus uh, that comes from encountering his amazing love. And then we live entirely for him. We're told in first John chapter four, verse 19, that we love him because he first loves us. And so eternal life actually begins here. Right. And that may be news for some of us that we don't have to wait until heaven to begin to enjoy the joys of eternal life. You can know Jesus and God who sent him right now. And we begin that experience here and we carry it with us into heaven. And so we can experience that presence and peace of God while here on earth. And so what makes heaven heaven is and secure is that eternal fellowship with Jesus right? Sometimes when I hear these conversations in church, what's heaven going to look like? What are the streets going to look like? How big is my house going to be? Will there be gardens? Is there water there? Is there not water there? Will my dog be there? And those aren't bad questions, but I just think that when we ask and focus on these questions, we kind of miss the entire point, that what makes heaven heaven is Jesus, that literally I can bow down at the feet of Jesus and wrap my arms around his legs, and I never have to be separated from him ever again. That's what makes heaven heaven to me. And I think that's what God is wanting us to begin to experience. And eternal life is just that, spending a lifetime forever in that type of relationship and experience. Now, we're going to need a paradigm shift. Um, coming into, God's, into contact with God's love for us and receiving eternal life awakens within us a desire to stop thinking only of ourselves. Paul has this statement that we're going to read here in a moment that speaks into that space. And to realize the great need of those around us to have this same type of encounter and security. So when we accept the gospel and it changes our lives, that's a tremendous blessing. But don't just stop there. Those same good vibes and amazing experiences you're having, you're meant to share those with someone else. So we find a love that awakens inside of us for people in our sphere of influence that wasn't there before when we encountered the gospel. Our care and concern for their well-being will grow. And that's, that's what we're hoping for, right? That's what we're looking for. Jesus says this in John chapter 15 and verse 13 and going through verse 15, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you and no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. So our calling is to be a friend of Jesus and to be a friend for Jesus. When we become a child of God and even a friend of God, he begins to place a love in our hearts for those around us. And it grows to the point that we would be willing to lay down our lives for the benefit of another. That's the intention. That's what God is seeking to do for and through us. And so part of what that's going to involve is death, but a good kind of death right? Jesus died to show us our own need of dying, to realize what the fruit of our selfishness really is. And he's wanting us to realize that we exist for a far greater reason than just fulfilling our own wants and desires, just doing me and getting mine, right? We exist to be used by God in active service to others. And a great example of this, especially speaking to a bunch of people from across the pond, is George Mueller, right? George, uh, this is now, I do not consider Wikipedia actual research, but their uh, biography here was very concise and I appreciated it. But it says this, that George Mueller was well known for providing an education to the children under his care to the point where he was accused of raising the poor above their natural station in life. Can you imagine? I would love to have that type of accusation marshaled against me, that he was accused of raising the poor above their natural station in life. He also established 117 schools, which offered Christian education to over 120,000 children, many of them being orphans. What an amazing life. But how did he get there? Someone asked him, what's, what's, the, what's the secret to your success? This is what he says. He says, there was a day when I died, utterly died, 
died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will, died to the world, its approval or censure. I died to the approval or blame even of my brethren and friends. And since then, I have only to show myself approved to God. A good kind of death. This is what he says. The child of God must be willing to be a channel through which God's bounties flow, both with regard to temporal and spiritual things. This channel is narrow and shallow at first, it may be. Yet there is room for some of the waters of God's bounty to pass through. And if we cheerfully yield ourselves as channels for this purpose, then the channel becomes wider and deeper, and the water of the bounty of God can pass through more abundantly. So the more that we allow God to work through us, the greater irrigation happens, the more of self is driven away and carried away by those living streams, and the more of God's bounties can pass through us. Talking about a good kind of death. Listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. Beginning of verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us, right? So it's not the fear of the imminence of the second coming or the fear of the judgment. If I don't witness, I'm going to be in trouble and God's going to be mad. What, what it is that drives the true Christian is love for Christ. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died and he died for all. And here's why. That those who live should no longer live for themselves. That's what the Bible literally says. Jesus died so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. And therefore, from now on, we no lo- we regard no one according to the flesh. And I think what's being implied here is that we don't view people in regards to their convenience to us. They're no longer commodities, that we look at people for what we can get out of them. But now we look at them according to their value in Christ. And so Paul says, even though we've known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him thus no longer. Many of us, what drives us to Jesus in the first place are selfish ambitions. And what I love is Jesus meets us where we are, a splitting hangover, a divorce, some form of tragedy or difficulty, and just seeking to get away from the bad things and find some form of closure or peace or relief. And I'm so thankful for the fact that whatever your motivations may be, if you come unto him, John chapter 6 and verse 37 tells us that he who comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Whatever your motivations may be in coming, he's not going to push you away. And I love this. And then he changes our ambitions. And so we no longer know Jesus according to the flesh. Paul continues in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he's committed to us the word of reconciliation. And so I love this. Some of us have really unhealthy views of God, that we can roll with Jesus, he died for us, and so forth. But the Father, we just wonder, man, is he, is he that disappointed parent in the sky that sees me for everything that I'm not? But the good news is Jesus didn't come to convince the Father to love you. Romans 5 and verse 8 says that God showed his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means that, again, Jesus didn't come to convince the Father to love us. It's because the Father already loved us that he sent Jesus, and he did that before you got anything right. That's what the Bible says. Verse 20 now of 2 Corinthians 5. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's our job as disciple makers, right? As a disciple of Jesus, part of what we are to be doing is reconciling men to God. For he made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What a power-packed series of verses, huh? Now, what we heard from the beginning, this is found in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And he's alluding to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. But then he gives, he kind of ups the ante here. He doesn't just say that I want you to love one another. I want you to love another, one another as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love us? Well, it says here in Ephesians chapter 5 and Titus 2 that he gave himself for you. 
John 13, he loved you in spite of what you've been. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. And in John chapter 15 and verse 13, he laid down his life for us. So this is the calling that we are given in making disciples to give of ourselves for others, to love them in spite of who they've been, and to lay down our lives for them. So true discipleship, um, the true disciples of Christ have love for one another in the same way that Jesus loves them, and they love God more than anything on earth. So Jesus is someone worth losing everything else for, as David Platt says. Now, this leads to love of those around you. And that love will lead you to give your life for your brethren, like those two greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Peter thought he understood this, right? He thought he loved Jesus this way. In John chapter 13 and verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. So he understands what Jesus is asking, and he says, I'll do that. But did he, though? right? Peter still valued his own life above the call that he was given. And we talked about that yesterday, actually, right? In the topic of devotions, that Peter actually denies Jesus right in front of the apostle John. The girl at the door says, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And that implies that John who's standing right next to her. She knows that he is a disciple. And Peter says, no, I don't know him, right? So he still valued his own life and, and was, was capitulating to, to peer pressure above the call that God had given him. But this is what we're told in John chapter 12, beginning of verse 24. Most assuredly, I say to you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, how does it remain? Alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Again, that good kind of death. This is what true disciples of Jesus go through. That when we die, then we become capable of producing much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. And if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So then we get to John chapter 21. We talked about that yesterday. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Those different words used for agape or for love, agape and phileo. Um, do you agape me, Peter? Do you have a perfect other-centered love for me? Peter's response was, yes, Lord, I phileo you. I have weak human love for you. Do you agape me? I have weak phileo love for you. And then the third time Jesus meets Peter where he is. He says, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter's response is, yes, Lord, you know all things. I phileo you. Peter finally recognizes, I can't love you like that in my own flesh, in my own strength. But Jesus gave him that type of love that he couldn't create. And once Peter experienced that death to self, that's when the, the Pentecost sermon happens, Acts chapter 2 and onward, where you see a different Peter. This is a really good exercise, by the way, if you're looking for a way to kind of improve your devotional life and where to go, just start in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, repeat. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, repeat. And if you do this for quite a while, you will recognize the difference in Peter once you go into the book of Acts. Do that. I do that for, for months. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, repeat. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, repeat. And then when I got to the book of Acts, um, I realized like, man, homeboy really grew up. Like he's a different person now. And it's because he truly experienced that death to self. The seed died and bore much fruit. There's this interesting statement that Jesus makes uh, in John chapter 17, beginning of verse four. He says, I'm praying to the father on your behalf and mine and on the disciples behalf. He says, father, I have glorified you on the earth. And then he says, I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Wait a minute. Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross yet. And then he says that I have finished the work that you've given me to do. How's that possible? David Platt in his book, Radical, Taking Back Your Faith from the American Dream. By the way, if you want to know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, this is an amazing book. Um, it's not just taking back your faith from the American dream. It's really the prosperity uh, Western worldview, not just America. He's an American and wrote this. Um, but anyway, I think you'd be greatly blessed in reading his book. Now, we have some differences of views theologically. He thinks if we don't go tell all the people uh, who are lost in the world about Jesus, they're going to burn in hell forever. I don't believe that. But there are many powerful, powerful, challenging statements and principles that Platt brings out in his book that I think you would do well to read. 
But he says this, we should have written this book, by the way. We dropped the ball, and so the rocks cried out and wrote a better book than, uh, you know, we sometimes produce uh, in some of these topics. So it is what it is. It's a great resource. I encourage you to read it. He says this, Jesus lived for them, meaning the disciples. During his earthly ministry, he spent more time with these 12 men than with everyone else in the world put together. This is astonishing when you really think about it. At the end of the Son of God's time on earth, he had staked everything on his relationship with 12 men. In the middle of his prayer in John 17, he even mentions that one of them, Judas, was lost. So now we're down to 11. And these 11 guys were the small group responsible for carrying on everything that Jesus had begun. One of his final moments with them is captured in Matthew chapter 28. The 11 gathered together and Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to, I'm sorry, I was probably quoting New King James and not even reading what his version says here, but in teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And Platt continues. After intentionally spending his life on earth with these 11 men, Jesus told them, now you go out and do the same with others. The mega strategy of Jesus, make disciples. So it's, it, it's this really big worldview shift for me when I read this book to recognize that like, man, Jesus took such a risk. Like if, if these guys blew it, no one would tell the world. And he came seemingly, you know, it would appear for nothing. But Jesus believed in this principle of discipleship. And if you pour into people everything that you have, right, if you if you labor for people until they can stand on their own spiritually, it does bear much fruit. Jesus died for them in many ways, not just physically, right? Jesus gave up. Uh, Jesus exercised a, a superhuman amount of self-control. You read the Gospels and see some of the dumb things that come out of these guys' mouths. It's amazing. But Jesus died to any fleshly reactions and chose to love them, believe in them, and keep laboring for them in spite of who they were and in spite of who they should have been at this stage. There's power in discipleship, and Jesus laying down his life for these 11 guys is what turned the entire world upside down, according to Acts chapter 17. So there's great power in this, and it's a high calling that we're given, but Jesus can empower us to do it, thankfully. All right. So we're to make disciples who will make disciples. We see this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul discipled Timothy, it's one of his disciples. He says, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we are to labor for people and to train them to labor for people. And the cycle continues. Right? The kingdom was meant to be advanced by the principle of multiplication, not just addition. So the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, some of you may there may have the King James Version. It says, go therefore and teach all nations. That's not the way the original language reads. It doesn't read that way. It reads to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What I love about this is the, the, the call to make disciples is sandwiched by two really powerful things. All authority has been given to Jesus, and because it's been given to me, Now I'm telling you to make disciples. And at the very bottom end of that, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So making disciples isn't something that you have to do in your own strength or that you're left out there by yourself. All the authority that Jesus has achieved on earth through conquering death, hell, and the grave is available to his disciples. And he's going to be with you as you're making disciples. So he couches or he surrounds the call to make disciples with a great amount of encouragement. And I love that. And also our calling is not to baptize people. You baptize people that you make disciples of. Unfortunately, there can be times where we make an idol out of the topic of baptism and that how many people we bring into the church through baptism is success. But the true measure of success is the people that you made disciples of, because you can get people wet, but that doesn't guarantee they're going to be there a year later. But if you disciple them and then baptize the people that you're discipling, and notice it doesn't stop with making disciples and baptizing, it says to keep teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. 
We should be loving and investing in these people long term. The goal is not, let me get through these studies real quick. Let me throw you in the tank and I hope you survive because no one really cares about you from that point forward. Right. Now, that's not the way our churches look. I'm not trying to be harsh, but we can almost in an undertone work in a way that is very lacking in discipleship. We focus on baptizing people. We don't focus on discipling them, and we don't keep teaching them and investing in them after they're baptized. We assume that they've arrived and they're on their own, and that's not really the way that we have been called to do ministry. Our calling is to disciple. You baptize the people that you disciple, and you keep teaching them and keep discipling them even after they are baptized. That's what Jesus said. These are his words on the text. Now, the truth about discipleship. This is kind of the, the, the painful truth about it. John 16, beginning of verse 21. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish. And I believe that these principles apply to making disciples, right? That, that it's painful. It's difficult. You're, Paul said this, those for whom I travail again in birth. He literally says that he travailed in birth for these individuals, not, not in a physiological sense, but in a spiritual sense, right? It's a painful, difficult process to labor for people, to talk them off the ledge repeatedly because they're going to quit because it's hard or I'm not good enough and this isn't working. It's difficult. You get those phone calls. You have a Bible study. They have a breakthrough. It's amazing. They finally get it. They understand the love that God has for them, and they want to move forward in God's healing love. And then you get a call two days later. I'm never going to be good enough. I've committed the unpardonable sin. And you think to yourself, like, ah, we just talked about this. Like, I thought you got it. You're going to have those moments, right? Like raising children. I don't have kids, but I've got this thing. And uh, man, he was he was a lot of work. I have a dog here. Um, it was a lot of work for me. And, and you think that you've reached a certain point of maturation and growth. And then lo and behold, bad things happen. And it's just, it's just the nature of laying down your life for someone. It means dying, right? You're going to go through painful difficulties. But here's the point, right? So I don't want to give you this false picture that go make disciples. And it's so awesome. There's never any struggles and uh, whatever. It is difficult and it can be painful at times. But here's the point. As soon as they've given birth to the child, they no longer remember the English. Whatever it is that it costs you, to labor for people, to, to labor for them, to bless them, to invest in them, and so forth. When you see them enter that watery grave and come out a disciple of Jesus Christ, and then you see them doing ministry and winning souls for Jesus, you forget all the pain that it cost to get to that point in time. For joy that a human being, they no longer remember the anguish, for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. I believe that this is a promise that Jesus gives, um, also on the topic of discipleship, apart from the, the general context of the verse, about the fact that he's dying and will come back. Now, so true biblical discipleship is laying down our life for people until they can stand on their own spiritually. And that takes as long as it takes. You don't rush that process. And I'll have an illustration on this, two illustrations to close. And then we'll open up for questions because I think we've made some pretty good time. So the first example is myself. I was such a mess, man. Craig talked about, you know, my, my biography or whatever. I'm terrible at stuff like this. I'm an introvert. I don't really know how to talk about me. I'd rather talk about Jesus. But people ask for these things and I give them. And Craig's a good dude. He's not a bad guy for asking this. It. what people generally do. But I didn't really know what to say. So I just like wrote one once and just recycled it because I don't try to focus on that. But um I was a mess, guys. I, I grew up in a home. My parents got divorced. My mom had been married once before my dad. Then she got divorced from my dad. She got married again. The guy beat her up really bad. I wasn't there when it happened, but it really, like this trauma really set me up for a lot of hardship in life. I just survived school. I didn't really attend school. Um, there was just so much unresolved brokenness and pain on the inside that I was just numbing for a majority of my life. And so my dad started, my, the, the September 11th attacks in 2001 in the United States rocked my dad. Now, we weren't atheists, but we didn't go to church. And I was kind of attending church just because a girlfriend once told me that I had to break up with you because you're not a Christian. I was like, what? I believe in God. Why would you say that? Um, so, you know, I started swearing less and going to church to try to keep the girl. That's not conversion. Um, but yeah, I just, it was just kind of my story. So I wasn't in a good place in life. And my, my priorities were all out of whack. 
professional music was my dream and my desire. That's what I was pursuing. And that's all that mattered to me. It was an idol to me. And so my dad, in, in the uh, when the 9-11 attacks happened, my dad realized the world is ending and I'm not ready. And when I say I'm not ready, I mean, he felt that he wasn't ready. And so my dad, unbeknownst to me, starts uh, in earnest a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for this happens for like three years, and I'm totally clueless because I'm just a messed up teenager, numbing pain all the time. And but in the summer of 2004, my dad started showing me love in a way I'd never experienced before. And it's because the love of God was in his heart. And I wanted what he had, and I didn't care what it cost. But what I didn't realize was how much dying I was going to have to do. And there was a lot of things I had to give up, a lot of idols, a lot of addictions, a lot of worldviews, a lot of tendencies and brokenness. And it was a gnarly evolutionary process. It wasn't that God spoke and it was so like the man that you see today that somehow is making a difference in people's lives is not the man that I was then. I don't even know how this happened apart from the grace of God. I was a mess, guys. And my dad, I gave him so many good reasons to give up on me as he labored for my soul. You think I get it and I mess up and make dumb mistakes. You think I get it and make dumb mistakes. My priorities are all to whack. And yet this guy just would not give up on me. No matter what I was doing, no matter how messed up I was, no matter how long this process was taking, my dad would not stop laboring for me until I was secure in the arms of Jesus. And that took years, guys, years. And I would not be doing what I'm doing today were it not for the fact that this man chose to lay down his life for me to ensure that I was where I needed to be. He left his jobs. He left everything. We ended up being homeless because he left everything and things didn't catch up for us financially. We tried and just didn't work. I go to Bible college and as I'm at Bible college at Arise, my dad goes to a homeless shelter. And when I graduate from that homeless shelter, I, or when I graduate from Arise, I end up going to the homeless shelter to join him for about four months until we went back to Illinois and eventually kind of we're able to get our lives back on a better footing financially. But this whole Sabbath thing and, and leaving our jobs and everything else, it was, it was a lot for us. And I don't think I ever would have made it through all that turmoil and difficulty were it not for the fact that my dad stood like a rock and labored for me when I gave him so many good reasons to just quit because this kid doesn't put out. This kid does not come around. Why waste your time? And so I, this is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this topic, because I wouldn't be talking to you right now doing what I'm doing were it not for the fact that someone took discipleship seriously in my own life. And I praise God for the fact it was my own dad. But I want to close with a story about my friend, Buddy. So while I was in that homeless shelter, literally, like I just finished the Arise program, got my certificate of excellence in hand, and I get on a bus. Uh, no, I get on a plane. I couldn't even afford to fly home. My pastor bought my plane ticket, and he flies me uh, back to St. Louis. I lived in Southern Illinois, which is about an hour and a half southeast of St. Louis. But my dad was at a homeless shelter that was based out of St. Louis, and then they had satellite locations in Missouri. Not that any of this probably matters in most of you. You're not even from the States. So this geography may not be very helpful, but it's in the middle of America, basically, right in the middle. And um, so I'm in the downtown location. But the thing is, like, I get off the plane. It's like 9 o'clock at night, maybe 10. And I have $10 to my name in my bank account. And I have to use my debit card to buy a tram ticket for like $5 to get from where I am uh, at the airport to downtown St. Louis from the airport. And then I have to walk multiple blocks to get to where this homeless shelter is. And they don't take people in at night. So they shouldn't let me in at that stage. But my dad had called ahead and said, hey, my son is coming. Please let him in. And so I'm walking through the streets of St. Louis it's super cold, thankfully. No one tried to rob me or beat me up or do something crazy because it's really, really, really cold, like zero degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what that is, Celsius, because the entire world is really strange and arrogant and wants to use something different than America. Can you believe that? Um, I'm just kidding. So uh, you understand how ridiculous we can be over here. And so uh, I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it was zero degrees Fahrenheit. And I... I get to the homeless shelter. Thank God they let me in. I don't have a cell phone. I had Magic Jack. Have you ever heard of that? We make a phone call through the internet. Uh, so it had like, there was an adapter for your computer that had a phone wire uh, 
a female port and you put in a phone cord and then you plugged a phone into your computer and you made calls through the internet. But the problem is at that stage, St. Louis was one of the lamest airports in, a, in the history of ever and you had to pay for the Wi-Fi. So I couldn't even call anybody. I literally just go there based upon the directions my dad gave me that I wrote down. Make it to the homeless shelter, go there, go through all this stuff. So I eventually get taken out to where my dad was a few days later. And we're in this place called New Bloomfield, Missouri. And um, dad's responsibilities at the homeless shelter were he was doing uh, a radio program. They had like a, a radio station. So he helped to run the radio station as far as like, you know, setting things up, programs to play and things like that. And he was doing prison correspondence. My responsibility was to take care of the sheet they had there and do prison correspondence as well. And so um, as I'm there, we're taking care of these sheep. And I learned pretty quickly that God was trying to teach me lessons. I think I was very much like Moses. Um, all my classmates had all these nice things to say about me, all oh, this, that, and the other thing. You know, I've never done a sermon before. I'm an introvert. I'm scared to death of this. I wasn't even Adventist when I went to Rise. I was nearly Adventist. I get baptized. But David Ashek has all these nice things to say about me. Matt Parra has all these nice things to say about me. My classmates are saying all these nice things. And uh, my head barely fit on the airplane because of it, just from, you know, uh, not inflammation, but inflammation of the ego. And God, in his great mercy, sent me to be homeless, taking care of sheep. I got the Moses treatment. So I'm taking care of these sheep. And I realized pretty quickly that God is trying to teach me lessons through them. And I learned more about the topic of discipleship through taking care of those sheep than I did at Arise. And that's not because Arise is not a good education. It was excellent. But we learn better through object lessons. That's why Jesus used them. And so I applied and learned what I learned in class uh, through this time with these sheep. And so as I'm taking care of them, the sheep would fight. Uh, they would headbutt each other. And sometimes they would get, if you ever like those toy cars, you put on the table, you pull it back and let go and it zips forward. It's kind of what a sheep fight looks like. They start horn to horn, they back up and they run full steam and hit ram to ram, you know, head to head. And the thing is the little sheep uh, catch on to this. So the lambs, they start doing the same thing because they've seen the older ones do it. Uh, there's some lessons there for us. In fact, there's a sermon on Audioverse called Whose Flock Is This, where I share all the stories of lessons I learned in taking care of the sheep, because there were a bunch of them. And one of those lessons is what I'm about to share with you right now. So one morning, we're going out to feed them, and this happened a lot, where uh, the mom would sprint. We would feed them bread, by the way. So all these bakeries in St. Louis would have bread that they couldn't sell after the first day that they serve it. So they give it to the homeless shelters. And once you got to a point where it was getting moldy, they put them in trash bags, they put them in a van. And once the van was full of bread, they would drive it out to where we were and we would feed that bread to the sheep because that was cheaper than hay. So like literally we're, we're feeding like Panera bagels to these sheep and stuff. And um, so we're, we're feeding these sheep bread and it would happen all the time that a mom would like sprint and she'd leave her babies behind and sprint to come eat. And then after she's done eating, she's like, oh, snap, where are my kids? And so she would go, blah, blah. And then the babies would cry. And they literally sound like a real baby crying. That's what a baby sheep sounds like. And so these little lambs. And so they would cry. And then the mom would cry. They start hollering back and forth. And then, you know, they run through the meadow in slow motion and, uh, you know, reunited. And it feels so good. So this happened all the time. So it's not you know, a unique scenario whenever that one morning I get out there and this mom is crying and I'm trying to find out where the lamb is. And there's one that's sitting out in the middle of the field. It's kind of sitting uh, where its legs are curled under its torso and then its head is kind of seated upright. And I walk out there to figure out what's going on. I was like, hey man, what's going on? And he was so rude. He wouldn't tell me. And so I kind of like push the side of its belly. It doesn't do anything. Then I pick it up under its belly. And as I raise it up, its legs just dangle like spaghetti noodles. So it's paralyzed. And I realized like coyotes are going to get a hold of this thing. I've got to do something. I can't just leave it out here. So I ended up getting this cage to put it in. And I knew at this stage what God was doing and what he was teaching me. And so if what I say next sounds crazy to you, I really don't care. This is one of the most impactful moments of my life. And it doesn't matter to me. So there's this little lamb. Uh, his name is Buddy. And I named him Buddy. You can see his little nubs there. Um, I didn't have a camera at that stage. All I had was like a white MacBook from the year 2009 or eight or something. But um, so I 
was I put it in this little pen and I put straw in the base of the pen and there's a little uh, base in there with water for it because it can't move. And I put a little, you know, tarp and stuff on top to keep it from getting really hot. And then I would close the cage up each night and then I'd, you know, get in there. I'd have to pull out all the bedding because he poops all over himself. He pees all over himself. So I'd pull out the straw each day, put in new straw. I'd hand him shoots of grass and feed him. I'd hand feed him bread. I'll show you that in a second. And then water. Um, just take care of it. But I knew the first day when I saw this, I knew what God was doing. I knew this needed to matter to me. And so I go back to the dormitory where I'm staying. I get olive oil. I come back and I anoint this little guy and I fast and pray and just ask that God would heal him. And um, so here's a little video. I don't know if you can hear him, but I don't really need you to hear him. So uh, here's footage of me just feeding him bread uh, he's a cute little guy, so he's kind of picky, unfortunately, but there we go. So he's chewing on the little piece of bread. Look at him. I don't know if you heard that, but there's sheep lying in the background. Um, and then I would have to give him water. So I take the water bottle and just kind of give it to him like this, kind of like bottle feeding, uh, but for water. And so I kept doing this, uh, taking care of him, and I'd pray with him every day in the morning, during my lunch break, and in the evening. I'd just go pet him, and I would just pray over him, replace his bedding, and just invest in him. And as time would go on, um, his front shoulder started to move. And um, I, it really, really meant a lot to me to see this. And so as, all right, I'll just leave it there for now. So as I'm kind of doing this work and kind of laboring for Buddy, his front shoulder starts to move. And I find out that my family, one of my family members has cancer. And so I try to get home to see my family. And as I'm going through that process, um, I uh, am trying to get ready to leave. I'm praying, God, please heal Buddy. God, please heal Buddy. And he eventually gets mobility in all four of his legs. Like, this is a miracle, guys. Like, all the people around are just like, it's a dumb animal. Just let it die. And I was like, look, man, it doesn't cause any problems with my work. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. And so I kept doing this. And right before I'm leaving, I'm like, God, please heal, buddy. So I'd pick him up under his belly. I'd lift him up. And then he'd put down all four of his legs. And I would start to release his weight onto his legs. And he would start to hold his weight. And then eventually his legs would quake. And then they would collapse. He'd fall down. He was close to being able to stand on his own, but he just couldn't quite do it. And I get to the very last day when I have to leave this homeless shelter to go back to where my family is and try to be near my family as my aunt's dying. And I just thought, God, please, please help Buddy. I'm pleading so fervently. And one last time, I pick him up, I ease him down, release his weight onto his legs, and he can't do it. Buddy is so close to standing on his own, but he just can't quite do it. And I leave. I asked one of the guys there who cared about the sheep more than most of the others. I said, hey, please take care of Buddy. And he wasn't going to do what I was doing, obviously, but at least to show some form of care. I thought Buddy would keep getting better in time. So I'm down. I'm trying to figure out where to go. Like I was homeless. I slept in my car one night, stayed at my pastor's apartment one night, stayed in a hotel for a week. My grandma put me in a hotel for a week. And just this kind of stressful process. Eventually I found a place to stay. And then my dad comes to join me. But right before my dad gets there to join me, I text the guy who's at the homeless shelter uh, who kind of oversaw all the workers there. And I asked him, I said, Hey man, um, how's buddy? This is D and how's buddy. I didn't have a cell phone still at this stage. I was using Google voice to text. And when he responded to me, this was the text that I got. Sorry, but he died. And in that moment, I knew why. I left. I left him before he was in a place to be able to stand on his own. And what eventually happened was he died. And I learned a lesson then that I will never unlearn. And I made a vow in that day that that is never going to happen to me ever again. And because this is just a dumb animal, it's a sheep in the middle of nowhere in Missouri, 
and for many people, who cares? But I knew what God was teaching me here, that the lessons that I was learning through this time of caring for these sheep was teaching me what God wanted to teach me about investing in people, and it had to matter to me, and it did. And God worked in a span of like 10 days. Buddy went from being fully paralyzed to having mobility in all four of his limbs because someone cared, someone was praying, someone was investing. And in the span of two weeks, Buddy died because I left him before he could stand on his own. And I made a vow that's never going to happen ever again. As I labor for people, as I disciple people, you can't just leave them like that. You have to ensure that they are properly cared for. And this has been the most profound lesson of discipleship I've ever learned. In fact, my dog here, Buddy, is named Buddy because of that sheep. I named him that because of that experience with that sheep. And I, I just hope and pray that any time that you see sheep, you're reminded of what I'm reminded of, that people matter to God and that he wants them to matter to us. Because we, we are so prone to be consumers, to not be willing to give, to die for the sake of others and for their benefit. And if people frustrate us, they get on our nerves, we just move on with our lives and we leave them to die. And I do not believe that's what God is asking. Now, there are some people who are not seeking to grow. They're not seeking to, to work through this process. They're not willing to get help. That's a different situation, right? We're talking about people who are open and who are willing and that while they're in this growth and vulnerable state, we just leave them and don't really properly care for them. The, guys, discipleship is not building a model airplane or collecting baseball cards or stamps. This isn't a hobby. These are souls for whom Christ died, and they have to matter to us. They have to. And that's the lesson that God's trying to teach us. And it helps us to learn how to be like Jesus, to be pleading with him to give us his love for his people. And he's willing to do it. But are we willing to ask? That's the question. Are you willing to let people in? Have you hardened yourself and walled yourself off? And I'm not going to let people close anymore because I got hurt or this happened or that happened. And having reasonable, healthy boundaries is one thing, but avoiding the call that God has given us to make disciples, that's, that's, not, that's not okay. To just avoid from that or avoid that and run from that. That's not what God has called you to. And so I just hope and pray that we will take this topic seriously, that being a disciple of Jesus involves dying, and making disciples of Jesus involves dying, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it, and that's my appeal to you today. As you've watched these videos, and you've learned different aspects of soul winning and Bible study and so forth over the course of Peace Online, don't let this be a, oh, that was nice. Oh, I did that once. That was a nice little experience, and then just leave it at that. God's call on your life is so much more than that. And any call that God gives you, he's willing to enable you to succeed in. But you have to be willing to move forward. And so anyway, that's my appeal to us today to value uh, the call to be a true disciple of Jesus and to make disciples for Jesus. And there is no better feeling in this world than laboring for someone and seeing them make a decision for Jesus Christ and then seeing them thrive in ministry. This is what I do for a living. I run a discipleship program. And to see my students grow and develop into beautiful human beings. I mean, people come here, they're struggling with different things in life. But we have a heavy emphasis on mental health. We do discipline differently. We talk through things. We work through things. And they become different people as a result of this process. Discipleship works. I see it. I do it for a living. And to see my students now walking in the light that God has given them and giving Bible studies. One of my students, we've got a promo video we just released recently. And one of my students made this beautiful statement that there's no better feeling in the world than knowing that someone gave their life to Christ because of you. And I know that because I do this for a living. This is my job. It's my calling. But to see my students taste of that and realize how special that is. No, there's nothing sweeter than this, guys. This is what you're made for. This is why when you go on a mission trip or you do some act of service for somebody and it makes you feel good inside, there's a reason for that. That's what you're made for. God made you to live for and to give for and to die for others. 
and you're you are no you are the most human and the most in harmony with who God has made you to be when you are actively involved in serving others and giving for others. And you don't do this to appease an angry God to get him off your back. It's a privilege to serve. And it's just amazing. And once you get that taste for soul winning and, and seeing lives changed, it, it, your whole life will never be the same. So I'd like to close with prayer and I want to open up to questions for you guys on uh, anything you'd like to talk about from yesterday's topic on devotions to personal intercessory prayer and on discipleship. So let's pray. God, I thank you that it was only an animal that died uh, with the painful lesson that you had to teach me. And Lord, I pray that you would give us your heart for your people, that people would matter to us because they matter to you. And so God, we want that. We want that to be our experience. And even if we're afraid for that to be our experience, would you act upon our small measure of faith and give it to us? Give us your love for our, your people, we pray. God, forgive us for being selfish, for living for us and looking out for us, and give us a willingness to live and give for others. Cover those sins with the blood of Jesus, we pray, and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, you can feel free to activate your cameras here and um, ask any questions that you may have, because that's why I'm here. I can stare at a screen awkwardly for the next 18 minutes if you want, but uh, I think it would be far more interesting and engaging if we got some feedback from you guys. So feel free to um, hop in and join and, and ask your questions. I just wanted to, oh, sorry, I'll put my hand up instead. <laughs> no, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. It's not a question as such, um, but I think for me, I'm just really grateful for what you shared, both in the video that we watched yesterday um, and from what you've spoken about today. And I think I just would like to share the conviction that I have had since you've been speaking. So I'm currently living with um, my mother and my younger brothers just moved in back into the house. And I just feel I... I feel like I need to do something to help them because they're not, I'm Adventist. My mother was, but she doesn't really go to church. And my brother really, I just realized he doesn't even know stories like Goliath and, you know, David and Goliath. I don't even know where to start, but I think this has really encouraged me to just to learn the principles and to put the principles into action um, and to have that, to do that with my own immediate family. So I'm really grateful for what you've shared. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, testimonies are certainly welcome too. It, it, it helps you better internalize what you've learned by verbalizing that. So we certainly welcome that too. And thank you for sharing. Um, God's going to honor that. I fully believe that. And you can just start with, with walking through a story a day in the Gospels. Uh, if they're open to hearing and listening, just let's take a look at Jesus. Here's a story here. Here's a story here. And just incrementally introduce him to the type of person that Jesus was. And then help them to recognize what Jesus said, that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This Everything that Jesus did on earth is what God the Father would have done if he were on earth. And that's how he does life. He's the perfect manifestation. When it says that he was the only begotten of the Father, he was the unique representation of the Father, the only one we've ever seen here. Um, and that's what's being alluded to there. And, and he's showing us that this is the way he does life, perfect other centered love. And he's in the business of healing the brokenhearted, of setting the captives free, setting at liberty, those who are in bonds of comforting those who mourn, giving them beauty for ashes. That's, that's how God does life. And that's attractive. That's Isaiah 61, by the way. Thank you. Amen. Who's next? So um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question. I, I heard a sermon. I'm not a peace student, <laughs> um, but I've done Bible worker training and I've done lay preacher training. And it, mm -hmm. I heard a sermon of yours a while ago on audio verse, and it was something you made a statement and I'm paraphrasing. I'm not expecting you to remember exactly the statement, but I just wondered if you could um, expound on it a bit more. But you said something like daily consecration is so essential in the shaping and abiding process. And I'm thinking about 
what that means because it's kind of like you know the daily consecration aspect and also the shaping and abiding process because um i really enjoyed what you did last night in looking at devotion personal devotion in an entirely new way because these were two things i hadn't really thought about but now i'm thinking about it more purposefully and i just wondered if you could expound on that a little bit more and i do have a second question but i don't want to dominate so if somebody wants sure. to come in i can come in with that one later well, I think you use far more sophisticated and eloquent language than I did. Uh, so praise the Lord for that. But the basic principle of Jesus prayed that Father sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Um, I think is the biblical principle there. This idea that um, if Jesus, well, for the prayer I generally ask people is, do Jesus's prayers get answered? Yes or no? The answer is generally yes. So if Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified by his truth and his word is truth, um, then what's the variable in the equation that can keep that prayer from being answered? It's not what Jesus prayed. It's whether we're opting into that, right? Are we taking that time daily to commune with him? And one of the ways I've kind of explained it, man, there's a guy, um, you know, he's getting a wormhole, but a friend of mine, Glenn Ballard, he posted this picture of um, a, a sculpture of a guy who, He's like really fit and ripped and buff and stuff. So maybe I shouldn't post that. But anyway, uh, but he's basically using a hammer and chisel and he's chiseling away someone who was obese. So like out, out the, the, the chiseled person is being chiseled out of someone who was, was formerly not in as good of shape. Um, and the point was that to, to be intentional in doing the work on yourself um, and I, I believe that when we have devotions, you're not going to see, like you read, you know, your devotions today for the first time, maybe ever, or you're starting to build a consistent devotional life for the first time in your life. Some of us get really impatient with ourselves. And so we think that like, if I'm not a different person in two weeks, then clearly this doesn't work for me. And I'm engaged in a futile industry, right? Like our futile venture that, this works for everyone else, but doesn't work for me because I messed up. There's too many things wrong with me. But the way that I view devotions is that we basically, every time that you take that time to commune with God, to consecrate yourself before him, to invite him into your life, every time that we're doing that, we're basically picking up a, a hammer and a chisel and taking one block off of that stone. And day by day, you don't notice a dramatic difference because they are incremental changes that God is making. We're told that sanctification is the work of a lifetime. And so it's their incremental changes that God is making, but just because you don't see change doesn't mean that God is not changing you. Ellen White uses a statement that silent though imperceptible, it may be speaking of character transformation. Um, she equates this idea, the seed and germination that um, such with character growth is the same in character growth. And so I think it's important for us to be uh, gracious to ourselves in the growth process that just because we don't look like Mark Finley after reading our Bible for two weeks doesn't mean that we're a failure as a Christian. Mark Finley has been reading his Bible for 30, 40, 50 years, whatever, right? Like, so it's, it, we are not to compare ourselves among ourselves. That's not really the point here. And that's actually the point that Jesus made to Peter in John 21 to some degree, right? I think there's a principle for us there. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yes, yes, yes. Then he says, follow me. And then Peter looks behind him and sees John and says, yeah, but what about this guy? And I don't know if I said this in the video or not. If I did, sorry, I'm saying it twice, but um, it's been a year since I did that video. But basically he turns around and says, yeah, but what about this guy? And Jesus' response is basically, that's none of your business. You follow me. And so if you are abiding in Jesus and communing with Jesus, how fast you grow is none of your business and stop worrying about it. That's not our problem. Our, our only responsibility is to abide in Jesus and to commune with Jesus. And when we do that, we will change. And how fast that is, don't worry about that. That's not your problem, right? That's not for us. That's not what you're saying. I'm not like telling you chill out, but I'm just saying that for us in general to not beat ourselves up and be so hard on ourselves for what we feel that we aren't right now, if you're abiding in Jesus, you're exactly where you should be. In fact, she makes a statement that we can be perfect at every stage of development in Christ Object Lessons. Uh, we can be perfect at every stage of development. In fact, there's a sermon on Audioverse right now, I think, uh, when I did the Three Angels messages at Heartland College, uh, that talks about that. It's called, um, I'll just open Audioverse and see, because uh, I don't have time to go into this full presentation right now, but it's uh, on Audioverse. It's called... Um,
No way. Oh, here it is. Yeah, the hour of his judgment has come. So zero three, the hour of his judgment has come. It's one of the more recent messages on Audioverse. If you just search my name, if that's quicker, uh, I walk into this whole process of kind of how God transforms his people and what that process looks like and how he views us in that journey. So that's that's my really long winded answer to your question. Uh, sorry about that. I chased. No, thank you. Really thank you. Thanks. What did that? Did I answer your question though? Yes, you did. Thank you. Yeah, okay. it's really helpful. That's the worst when they get rambolitis, but they never actually answered your question. It was just 40 years in the wilderness and we're still here. Okay, next question. And if no one has one, then I'll let you go for round two. Okay, Deborah. Hi, uh, good evening. I just want to ask, you know, when uh, you are making discipleship, like what I struggle because you said that, like, with the story, with the testimony, you say we should never leave the person. Yeah. But yeah. also, I also struggle to, you know, to have a good relationship, you need to be vulnerable to the person. But how do you know? I always I always think if I share too much, uh, then maybe this person will escape because they will find that I'm not that perfect. But we are not perfect as Christians, although we know the Bible, although we try to follow, but we are not perfect. And sometimes with the people that are not, um, Christian, I say, so they have this picture of you and I'm like, how, how do you do this? Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, vulnerability is hard, isn't it? Um, it's kind of scary. Uh, there is, and I'm not, I just don't have time to answer everything as thoroughly as I'd like to. So when I refer to messages, I'm not a narcissist. <laughs> Uh, I just, I've covered this in another presentation. There's, there's a message on Audioverse called the strength of vulnerability. Um, because what is amazing to me, it's called the strength of vulnerability. If you just want to look that up, right. I'll go in more in depth in it, but the, um, Jesus lived a life of radical vulnerability and he communicated that he had needs. And if Jesus can do that and not lose our respect, I think we can too. Um, and I, I have found that now there's, there needs to be a line there, obviously, right? Like you don't want to build a radical dependence upon people and you don't want the people you're discipling to build a radical dependence upon you, right? You are a conduit who's seeking to connect them with Jesus. You're not trying to supplant Jesus or filling this kind of like papal role that they have to come to you to be able to get access to him. That's not how this works. From the very get-go, our desire should be to point them to Jesus. And when I say it, I, I make strong statements or I made strong statements about leaving people and so forth. We need to be constantly praying with God. Is this person ready? Is this a use of my time that is bearing fruit and that I need to leg this out? Or is this someone who is, is, is fighting the process? They don't want to go there and there are limitations to what I can achieve. And we need to be willing to acknowledge the fact that we aren't God. God is God, and you may just fill one role in this process, and someone else is going to pick up where you left off when that person is in a season of life where they're ready. Yeah? So I want to kind of give that clarification, but um, many of us have just struggled to really have people matter to us at all, and that's the, po that's the point of that illustration, um, but it's not to be a dogmatic statement of like you're investing in someone, but they keep going back into heavy drug addiction. They're using your money that you give them to try to help them and so forth in harmful ways, it's an abusive relationship and they're, you know, a narcissist or they're gaslighting. That's a whole nother scenario, right? Those are totally different scenarios. We're talking about people who are fertile, who are ripe and that will require patience. Yeah. So, yeah, but showing, showing, I mean, Jesus, um, discipled, he invested in the woman at the well in John chapter four by first telling her that he had needs. I'm thirsty. Would you give me some water? And she's like, uh, wait, what? What are you, a Jew, doing talking to me, a Samaritan woman, and asking things of me? And she gets so enraptured by this conversation, she never gives him a drink. Um, but the point is that he began that conversation of laboring for her by making the first move of vulnerability. So it depends. Just ask God for wisdom. God is in the business of, of supplying wisdom. We just need to be open to asking, right? And if he asks you to go where, somewhere, uh, there's a reason why he's asking you to go there, right, with some of your story. You don't need to give gory details. Uh, in fact, it's best to not give those, but to just communicate like, hey, Christians struggle too. I mean, Jesus's life was filled with suffering, filled with it, lonely, discouraged, betrayed, abandoned, abused. Like, 
It's to have a story that mimics Jesus's story does not make you a weak person, right? It makes you a Christian. (laughs) You live in a broken world that violates. And so the fact that Jesus can relate to this person that way, for them to see that a Christian can relate to them can then help you plug them into Jesus who can relate to them. Does that make sense? That's a great question. Great, great question. Who's next? All right, Sandra or Sandra, hop in there. And then if someone Thank else you. wants to go, they can. Is it Sandra or Sandra? Um, well, I'm from Yorkshire, so we just say Sandra. Sandra, but all right. Further down south, they say Sandra. All right. <laughs> so I don't mind. Um, it's re- I'm really thinking about uh, some of the things that you, you've been saying in terms of if you're working with someone who um, they really seem to, to get it and everything seems to be going okay and then they have a difficulty and it's like they've forgotten everything they've learned mm-hmm. about relying on God and claiming promises and praying and then you, t- you walk them through that process again and it seems to build them up and then something else happens and they're right back again and they seem to have forgotten everything that they've learned and that cycle that just keeps getting repeated and I think what you were saying earlier is that Jesus meets us where we are so um you know going through that cycle isn't so much of a bad thing but I'm just wondering if there's anything amiss in what they may have been taught by the Bible worker me for example that maybe I'm missing something that either puts the dependency back on me that they keep coming to me every time something goes wrong or it's just that they keep forgetting everything and needing to relearn it and I just wondered if there was anything um, you might advise on how to avoid those situations or what to do when faced with those situations. That's an excellent question. Like seriously, where's the, where's the little clapping hands? If I had, if I could find the clapping hands, I would, uh, right here, bam. Thank you. That was amazing. Cause it's, it's so true. So let me, um, I don't know how to turn it off. Sorry about that. Let me grab some books real quick and I'll show you, uh, some things that have helped me, uh, Okay, so I would recommend some resources because most likely there are mental health challenges this person's in working through in some form or fashion. Their part of their story is unresolved. Their view of themselves, their view of God, their view of God's view of them. Um, and so addressing that is really important. This is why just transfer of information style ministry falls short. Jesus never did that. Jesus was, he didn't come to heal the broken theology. He came to heal the broken hearted. Yeah. So Isaiah 61 says, and he quotes that in Luke four, when he stands before the, the church, opens the scroll of Isaiah and points to this section says, this is what I came here for. So the way in which we do ministry should look the same. We should be healing the brokenhearted, setting the captives free, setting at liberty those who are in bonds, bring comfort to those who are mourning, the oil of joy for mourning, right, and so forth. So there's some resources that can be helpful uh, in addressing some of that. The first one, is this backwards, by the way, when you guys, or is this forwards? You can read it? Yes. Okay, so To Be Told by Dr. Dan Allender uh, is an amazing book dealing with the topic of how to process your own story in the painful chapters and how God wants to co-author a better story for us in future chapters. Really, really good. There's some traces of Calvinistic thought in the first chapter or two, but uh, he's Presbyterian, but it's so good. It, you'll, you'll be fine. It's a very, very good book. To Be Told by Dan Allender. Um, my friend Paul Conniff has a book called The Hidden Half of the Gospel. This addresses the issue of core beliefs, things that we believe about ourselves based upon the things that we go through. And this is connecting Jesus' story to this person's story. It's called The Hidden Half of the Gospel, How His Suffering Can Heal Yours by Paul Conniff, P-A-U-L-C-O-N-E-F-F. His co-author, Lindsay Gentke, uh, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, Gentke, G-E-N-D-K-E, she has a book called Ending the Pain, I think, um, where she tells her own story of working through that. Uh, I know that in certain cultures, especially like in Europe, this whole idea of vulnerability and mental health is like, uh, yeah, we don't do that. Um, The problem is, yeah, uh, Jesus did do that. So we're just going to have to crucify that part of our cultures 
and embrace the gospel in that area. We can still be proud of where we're from and, and, and delight in the things that we learned from the cultural upbringing, but there are certain aspects of our cultures that are going to have to die in our personal experience, and that's one of them. Uh, running away from vulnerability, mental health challenges, and so forth, and topics like that, we need to have more conversations, not less on these issues. We're in, this, we're in the situation we are right now because we don't talk about it. Um, Paul Conniff has another book called Brutally Honest. Uh, it's dealing with strong emotions. Uh, you read Psalm 109, it's pretty gnarly, right? Curse my enemy, knock his teeth out, make his wife a widow, his children childless, curse them for generations afterward, and curse the previous generations before this guy came around. It's just bad. What to do with heavy, strong emotions? Uh, this book is amazing. Uh, this thing will rock your world. It's called How We Love by Mylan and Kay Yurkovich. How We Love by Mylan and Kay Yurkovich deals with the topic of attachment styles. And so uh, I would encourage you to become informed on the topic of mental health. Uh, Mm -hmm. I preach a ton of stuff on it. They're um, beautiful minds medical. There's a mental health clinic in America that's doing stuff. They're making podcasts. Now Amanda anguish works there. Dr. Katie Elson works there. Look both of those girls up on Audioverse. They've got resources on mental health. Um, Yeah. I I would just encourage you to kind of become better informed on this topic because one of the reasons why those cycles continue is because they're not dealing with the root wounds inside. So we have temporary relief with a moment of profound truth, but we never actually release the lie that's lying inside. And truth doesn't cover lies. It needs to, we need to uproot the lies to then be filled with truth. And so um, we need to address that too. So that's one of the things I wish I had been better informed of way earlier in my life, but God in his great mercy at least gave it to me <laughs> now. So, um, those topics are super, super important. So, cause then you can find out what the real stumbling blocks are for them. And it's usually stuff like that. Uh, not theological differences. Oh, I'll just give the same study a second time. Maybe now they'll get it like, That's or I'll give the same doctrinal study, but from another ministry and that'll do it. No, they're broken. We all are. And the reason why we don't move forward is because we haven't addressed what hurt us in the past. So, okay. Yeah, That's good. really helpful. Thank you so much. You That's bet. Good. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Uh, if you're dealing with people, and I'll close with this. Um, uh, all right. Lastly, if I'm giving resource recommendations for holistic healing, if you're dealing with people who struggle with sexual brokenness, because that's another big issue in the church and outside of the church, there's a book by Jay Stringer. He's, he's, he was actually taught by Dan Allender called Unwanted. This book is fire. Anyone struggling with sexual brokenness, Unwanted by Jay Stringer. Because we're talking about making disciples, like you're going to be discipling people who struggle. We need to talk about this stuff. So that's one. Jay Stringer has an online curriculum called uh, Journey to the Heart of Man. And it's like going through therapy. It's very, very, very good of addressing, asking yourself the hard questions of why you are where you are. Most of our approach to sexual brokenness has been dead wrong. Um, and this deals with it from a biblical mental health and scientific perspective that I think is spot on dealing with root core issues as opposed to just lust management. Um, Dan Allender wrote a book. If someone's dealt with sexual trauma, uh, he wrote a book called the wounded heart. Uh, that's also very good. Dan Allender, the wounded heart, um, hope for adult victims of childhood sexual abuse. Um, so if someone's wrestling with heavier, heavier issues like that, it's another great resource. And then lastly, um, there's a book called The Great Sex Rescue by Sheila Gregier and uh, her daughter, Rebecca and Joanna something. Uh, but The Great Sex Rescue, this, de- uh, this is like you're about to get engaged or you are married type heavy stuff. Um, but it's, it's reworking the whole landscape in the way that we've talked about this topic, especially how it's been largely weighed against women. Some of the, the marriage books that people are reading and other stuff are actually harming women. Um, and communicating things in a way that's very unhelpful and damaging, uh, which leads to issues in intimacy and so forth. Um, it's another resource I think is very, very, it's a Christian resource, similar to Jay Stringer's book on dealing with the topic in a very scientific, mental health, and biblical way. Some of her theology in there challenges some of the ways we've viewed some stuff, but she's totally right. Uh, we just have misread some text and used them to the uh, unfortunate um, uh, downside for women. So anyway, those, those resources will help us just to be healthier people as disciples of Jesus and to make healthier disciples of Jesus. Thank you. All right. Hey, we did it. I went over by five minutes. Sorry, Craig. 
AD. No, that's fine. Um, I think it was needed. So very grateful for the presentation. I'm sure everybody here is grateful for the presentation as well. D, just before I ask you to close with prayer, could you maybe just share with everybody how and what the process is that they can go through to maybe attend core? And um, if you have, uh, I mean, you, you've mentioned about core online, just what the opportunities are with that too. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that. So um, we have core is a nine month discipleship and evangelism training program. We're part of the Pennsylvania conference. So the, the people who would come second semester um, would basically be attending just the second half of course. So you wouldn't get the literature evangelism canvassing side or the mission trip uh, and some of the practical ministry classes, but you would get most of our theology and all of that. Um, if you want to attend, uh, go to core online, sorry, coreevangelism.com. And there's a section entitled track two. When you go to like uh, programs, there's one called track two. And if you fill out the application, um, then just kind of state, hey, I'd like to come to track two. And um, I think the cost is around $5,000, somewhere around there. Uh, but then the work you're doing on campus, I think, diminishes that a little bit. I can send you an email. If you have questions, just email me. Um, but that uh, starts in January and ends at the end of May. So you can come on a visitor's visa. We can write you a letter of invitation and see if it works. You know, that's really up to, to immigration if they bring you in the, the border or not. But um, you're only coming to volunteer for a religious purpose, and then you're leaving. You're not staying. So we would give you an invitation letter that would look like that. And so if you're interested in coming in person, Mark Finley, David Ashrick, Justin Kim, uh, a bunch of people, you know, are teaching uh, Dr. Katie Elson. I think I mentioned her earlier. She teaches on mental health. Paul Conniff teaches first semester for us, so they wouldn't get that class, but you would get others, mental health intensives. Elise Harbold, actually. Craig, your classmate, she teaches for us, too, on the topic of mental health. Um, and then we have Lee Wellard. Uh, he's a naturopathic doctor and herbalist. So you learn about health remedies and other stuff too. So you get a pretty broad training uh, on that side of things. Chad and Fadia Cruz are teaching on relationships and uh, uh, also media choices. So lots of, lots of good stuff. Um, so if you want to know more, go to our website. And when it comes to the um, yeah, the nine, nine month course we, we provide, we're on the same campus as an academy. So three meals a day, seven days a week, you've got lodging, you've got food, all that's provided. That's built into the tuition itself. Um, so it's 10,000 for nine months. I think it's 5,000 for the, the half semester. And, um, yeah, the canvassing work goes towards the tuition. So that cuts it down, whatever you make in canvassing, half of that goes towards your tuition. And uh, that's why we've designed it. We're working on trying to find ways to get people here for the full nine months visa wise. Uh, but for sure, a visitor's visa is only six months and that lasts the length of the second semester. So if you want to let it roll and come for a semester and hope you can renew your visa and come back, we can try. But a, a, a full visa route we're working on, we just don't have that finalized yet for international students. Hopefully by next fall, we could. Um, but people could come this coming spring and go ahead and register anytime now. So that's open. And uh, the core online aspect, we are hoping, uh, we've got some behind the scenes stuff we need to take care of, just finishing some cleaning up of the audio, uh, the audio and video from files from last year to get them published. Uh, very similar to the video you watched yesterday, that was one of our modules. So you watch a video, you take a quiz, that stuff we're working on right now, the website stuff is nearly done. So now it's just that side. So as soon as that's up and going, then you can apply. Um, and we're working on a model. We were kind of debating whether to be a subscription model or just a full-blown tuition model or a suggested donation model. We're praying about that. So we don't have a final decision, but um, it will be available by God's grace, January 1 or at the latest spring of 2022. So people can go through every class that we offer. Uh, you'll get all of them through the core online thing. And we'll also have an a la carte option. So if you just want to take the classes on like prophecy, Daniel, Revelation, Three Angels Messages, you just want to take the Adventist Fundamental Beliefs, just want to take the health classes, um, we will have some a la carte options, or you can just take the whole thing, or you can just do a subscription model. And then when your subscription runs out, then you just stop accessing the files. So that's the options that we've got. And all of that information will be found on our website, coreevangelism.com. And then you can follow us on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. We've got stuff there too. In fact, we just published an interview on our Facebook page that gives that we did at 3 a.m. two weeks ago uh, that shows the whole big picture, what the program is and how it works. That's all there. And then Weimar College is actually going to be offering college credits. If you want to attend Weimar, uh, you can transfer credits from Core into Weimar. So that's, that sounds that's big picture. 
Yeah, that sounds excellent, Dee. Um, so thank you for that. So if any of you are interested in attending CORE, do check out the website that Dee mentioned. And um, hopefully you'll hear from, from some of the people who have attended this session soon, Dee. Um, right. Dee, would it be possible? I mean, could you just close for us with prayer? And then I'll just bring this to a close tonight. Happy to. Thanks, Craig. God in heaven, thank you for speaking to us, for giving us a chance to learn how to be disciples and make disciples, and how to improve our prayer lives with a short little appendix on that. And pray that you continue to grow us as we've resourced. Uh, there's reading we can do and messages we can listen to. Continue to grow us and help us to become healthier and more whole Christians who preach a healthier and more whole message. This is our plea today, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.